Good afternoon and welcome to the Financial Market Authority's uh, Investing Q&A for World Investor Week. I'm Gillian Boys, Investor Capability Manager at the FMA, and with me is finance columnist, commentator and author Mary Hong, most recently of an introductory guide to investing for the FMA called Hits and Myths. Here it is. Um, great likeness of Mary on the front here. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure, Gillian. Great to be here. That's great. Well, look, we're going to be here until 2 o'clock answering questions sent in by investors. Now, if something occurs to you as we talk, you can send your question in as well via Messenger. We won't state your full name, so don't be shy. We do already have a few questions to get through, so we'll get started on them soon and answer as many as possible in the next hour. Now, before we start, a quick note that Mary's opinions are her own. Her advice is of a general nature, and she is not responsible for any loss that may be incurred from following it. First, though, can we just kick off generally with your thoughts on the current state of investing in New Zealand? Yeah, it's interesting what's been happening the last... Well, since COVID, really, Gillian, the, the way a lot more people, particularly young people and apparently particularly men, mm. are getting interested in the share market and in the online trading platforms and so on. It's a little bit worrying in one way because the market went down and then came straight back up again, and I'm a little bit worried that some people might think that it always recovers that quickly. But on the other hand, it's great to see New Zealanders getting back into shares after the, the share market crash, a lot of older New Zealanders got out for good, yeah. and it's really nice to see a new generation taking a, a good interest in it. Yeah, and, yeah. and actually a lot of women too, apparently, yes. so we've been talking with some of these platforms, and people are giving it a go, so yeah. I think that's really great. Yes, yeah. I do too. Yeah. 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 Well, look, um, let's get straight into some questions, because we've got quite yeah. a few to get through. Um, the very first one the team here have called um, Anxious Mary. <laughs> it's probably not you, is it? Um, maybe we'll Hope rename not. her Anne, otherwise it's going to get a bit confusing. Yes. Um, so Anne, um, she is a 66-year-old grandmother. Her retirement nest egg isn't earning as much in the bank as uh, she would like it to be. She's got some money in a KiwiSaver growth fund, which is interesting, and she's open to putting more into KiwiSaver, perhaps with some different settings. She doesn't want to play the share market or own a rental, but she is considering land banking, which is not something I know a lot about. So she says, I don't know what to do. What, what should she do? Mary? Yeah, so she's an interesting one. She's obviously not averse to risk, Mary. I better call you your real name. Um, uh, given that you're, you're in a KiwiSaver growth fund and given that, that you're interested in land banking, which I assume you mean just buying some land and sitting on it and hoping that it grows in value, which is actually quite a risky proposition. I mean, it doesn't always work that way. The land sometimes goes down in value. And the other negative about it is you can't sort of sell off a little bit of that investment as you could if you were in a managed fund or in in shares. You've got, you've got to sell the whole lot or, or none at all. So I'm not that keen on that idea. But I think um, putting money in in funds like the growth fund you've already got is, is a great idea for longer term money, money you don't need for 10 years or more. Mm. Money that you need for the, the first three years, um, the next three years I should say, best to put it in either bank term deposits or a low risk type of fund. Um, middle level risk for money you need from say three to 10 years and the longer risk, the longer term money for the for the higher the higher risk money for the longer term yeah. is what we're after here, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And interesting, so she's 66, so she can go into KiwiSaver now yes. and, or stay in KiwiSaver and, and she can access her money. Easily, really good she? point. Yeah. That a lot, of, a lot of older people are not realising, a lot of them never did get into KiwiSaver because th they thought, well, they were ineligible. Mm. Um, they were over 65 when the whole thing started. But anyone of any age now can be in it and it's actually quite a good vehicle for people over 65 because they can take their money out whenever they want to. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Great. All right. Well, look. Hopefully, that's helped out. Um, anxious Mary. Yes. Um, so Deborah has a slightly more technical question around index funds. Oh. Um, and we might need to explain what index funds are. But she asks, who holds your money when you invest in index funds? Is it the fund, or is it the broker or service provider? Yeah. Yeah. Now, first of all, index funds are funds, share funds usually that invest in all the shares in the share market index, like the NZX fifty or the S and P five hundred in America, etc., and they're, they're widely diversified funds because there's a lot of shares in the index. They're they're cheap to run and therefore they have low fees. And I'm actually a big fan of index funds; always have been for for decades. Um, 
And she, now, what was she asking again? She was, oh, who holds the money when you invest that's in That's right. Fund? So it's not really, it's not really anyone holding the money as such, like a bank term deposit would be. The money's being spent on shares. So the fund manager takes your money and buys shares, takes your money and many other people's money and buys the shares in the share market index. And what you own then is units in that fund and and the value of them goes up and down as the market goes up and down. And when you want your money back out again, the fund manager will sell some units to give you your money back. Mm -hmm. yeah. And look, speaking as the regulator here, obviously we want people to use regulated uh, index funds or Absolutely. managed funds um, yeah. because those have got protections in place. Um, and it, it means that if something does go wrong, then then you've got some recourse. So uh, really important extra message yes. that I can throw in there. Um, we'll move on to one that I know a lot of people ask from um, Madel, and this is um, uh, home loans versus investing. Yes. So, you know, home loans, uh, the interest rates are really low at the moment. Yes. She says, am I better off investing my extra money in an ETF with, say, a 5 to 7% return instead of making extra mortgage repayments? If not, why not? Yeah, now ETF's another one we might just have to quickly define. Yeah. It stands for Exchange Traded Fund, and that means it's basically a managed fund, which KiwiSaver funds are an example of a managed fund where there's a whole lot of different investors' money in a pool. Um, exchange Traded Funds, you buy and sell the the shares in it on, on the stock exchange. But in, in essence, it's actually not very different for an investor from any other managed fund. Um, so she, now she's considering, um, no, gosh. So she again. wanted to put it, well, she's thinking about, should she put it in one of these exchange oh, traded yes. funds? And um, yeah, you know, paying she down a mortgage. notices that some of them are sort of averaging five to 7%. And, yeah. and hopefully she's realised that that's, that might be an average and sometimes that will be higher than that and sometimes it could be much lower or could even be, negative. Or definitely could be negative and yeah. can be very negative in a, in a, in a really bad year. Um, and that's the point, that in any kind of managed fund, ETF or otherwise, you can have years where your investment value actually halves, or, or worse, it has happened, yeah. and it, it will happen again sometimes, whereas paying down the mortgage is a very low-risk investment. Um, and so generally speaking, I say better to pay down the mortgage Although it's not as good a deal as it used to be because interest rates on mortgages are low yeah. and therefore getting rid of that debt is not as big a deal as it used to be when you were paying down a 10% mortgage, let's say. But nonetheless, I personally think it's a good idea for most people to, to put extra money into getting that mortgage down, preferably getting rid of it. it it's psychologically good, nice to own your own home, Without a mortgage, it means that if you, in an emergency you can get, come back and and borrow again, usually. Nearly always a bank will then let you borrow again if you need the money. So it gives people a basic security in case they lose a job or something like that. So generally speaking, one big exception is being in KiwiSaver. You want to be in KiwiSaver even if you've got a mortgage in order to get the government and employer contributions. Definitely be in KiwiSaver as well as the mortgage. But beyond that, I would say pay down the mortgage for most people is a good idea. Right, yeah. so Siri had, had asked a similar question, um, you know, paying down the mortgage does seem sensible, but a bit dull, especially yes. with the cheap money available now. So, but you're also suggesting perhaps dull can be psychologically yes. a, a great thing. It's a good, good <laughs> point, Siri, yes, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, look, and look, if you're in a position where you enjoy taking a bit of risk, and some people do, particularly men actually, but not always, and they, you know, that's part of the excitement of life is taking a bit of risk in your investing, then you might want to be investing more instead of paying down the mortgage. There's no right and wrong here, but it does depend on your risk tolerance, really. Yeah. yeah. So maybe you give something smaller go, have a little yeah, dabble absolutely. and learn by doing a little bit yeah. while, while still being a little bit dull. Yes, <laughs> but both. Absolutely. Yeah, maybe, yes. yeah. yeah. Um, now, bonus bonds. Um, we're yeah. hearing those are closing down, so... Robin asks, is it safe to hold out for the year before I cash in my bonus bonds? Yeah, that's an interesting think. one. Yeah, I know I've you've been, had a lot of those yeah, questions in a lot your of column, questions. haven't you? I have about bonus bonds. And and basically, yeah, do you cash in now? If you don't cash in in the next 
few months, I'm not sure when the exact deadline is, then your money is sort of held until ANZ's gone through the whole process of, of cashing up the fund and working out exactly how much money people are going to get. And they do say in, in, on their website that there is a possibility that people, you know, if you had 10,000 in there, that you might get slightly less than 10,000 back again. More likely, though, that you'll get somewhat more than 10,000. How much more? It seems like nobody knows yet at, at this point. I'm sort of saying to people, look, if you've been in bonus bonds, you've been in something with a bit of a gambling element in it anyway, so maybe you want to just leave your money in there for that last last fling of a gamble and see and see how much comes back out again. Right. Yeah. It might take some people that long to find their bonus bond certificates well, anyway. <laughs> yeah, good point. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah. Yes, yeah. All right, Lant, look, we've got a question here, and I'm really glad someone's asked this, um, because I think we spend a lot of time um, talking about how to build your wealth for retirement. And yes. there's really not that much information out there for people who are retired. So Sharon says, if, if you're already retired, how do you make the money last for 30, 40 years? Um, yeah, yeah, yes. How do you do that? Look, a very basic rule is... At retirement, if you've got $100,000, you can spend $100 a week. If you've got $500,000 at retirement, you can spend $500 a week. And your retirement money that you're saving should last if you spend it that way. That's a fairly conservative rule of thumb. Um, and, and putting the, the money you're going to spend in the first few years in low risk and then the longer term money in high risk, which we talked about a little bit earlier, um, those are some basic rules. I mean, there's this whole book written about how to handle retirement money, but don't be too scared to, to spend a bit in early in retirement. I do get quite a few letters from people at, say, age 80 who say, I wish I'd spent more in early retirement. Mm. Yeah. Okay, cool. And actually, we've um, just got a, a new question in um, from mm. John, and um, this is uh, around what's the best way to begin buying shares for grandchildren. So other in the scope, maybe someone who yes. is retired and thinking about buying some shares for their grandchildren. That's an interesting, yeah. interesting idea. Um, I would always recommend, rather than buying individual shares, buy shares in a fund because then you get the diversification which reduces your risk. On the other hand, if he's buying for grandchildren, he might just enjoy the idea of buying shares in some company that the grandchildren might relate to. Yeah. So, I mean, maybe restaurant brands or something like that, if the kids often go to, to some of those yeah. restaurants or something like that. Yeah. So when they go and eat there, they can say, oh, look, I'm, I'm adding to the profits of, of my company. So when it's small amounts like that, it, it can, be, they can be playing around with it a little bit and showing the kids how, how shares can go up and down. Yeah. Um, kind of a fun idea, yeah. perhaps. And I know yes. some of the online platforms have accounts that are, are dedicated to children. So That's right, they so do. You can do that. Some of the fund yeah. managers offer, um, you know, low fee um, amounts. Like, is that something you'd want to think about? Absolutely, too? yes. Yeah. Good point, some, yes. some good ones, yeah. Um, now, a lot of people are worried about ethical investing. Oh, yes. Um, so Barry asks, what do you suggest for people who are worried about the harmful impacts of their KiwiSaver investments? Um, but this yes. might extend to, I guess, people thinking about any type of investment. And yeah. most funds are now talking about investing ethically or responsibly. But how do you know whether your one is? Yes, yeah. it's a really good question. And it's, the in interest in ethical investing has really soared yeah. in New Zealand in the last couple of years, Yeah, which is, which is neat, I think. Why not? Um, and the website to use is Mindful Money, which is, is not a government website, but it's set up um, by a group and a, a charity, basically, I think they are. And what you can do there is, first of all, go and have a look at your KiwiSaver or non-KiwiSaver managed fund, any of the broad funds that are invested in shares, bonds and so on, and see how ethical it is. They, the, the group's gone through and categorised which funds are more ethical. And secondly, a kind of neat feature there is that you can you can um, choose which type of ethical issues concern you the most out of, say, environmental or um, ammunition, for not like it, or companies that make tobacco, etc. You can you can rank according to what matters most to you, yeah. these different issues, and then they'll come up with a fund that sort of best matches what matters to you, which is kind of a neat feature. 
No, that's, yeah. that's really cool. And um, uh, another um, option for people is uh, the Smart Investor tool. Yes. So um, some of you may, may be familiar with this tool on the Sorted website. Um, what you can do there is you can search for, if there's a particular company that you're concerned about, you can just search for that company name and the Smart Investor search will bring up um, all the funds that have that particular company in or you can go to your fund and actually download a list of every single investment and have a look and see if that, that fund is there. So, you know, there's, there are ways to um, find out this information and yes. the FMA is working on some extra guidance for for the people who offer funds about what they need to tell people because it's fair to say at the moment it's, it's, it can be a bit mysterious um, and if you're really trying to, to invest ethically, it can be quite hard to actually do. So yeah. we want to see that improve. Um, yes. Indeed. Um, oh, here's, here's a question with a compliment, Mary. So I have to ask this one, oh. don't I? So Tess <laughs> has said, um, top tips for newbie investment investors. Uh, so Tess has started using shares and Hatch, but investing in general is quite overwhelming. But she says, P.S., I love your book, Rich Enough, and love your work, Mary. <laughs> oh, Tess, <laughs> thank you. So That's now you have to give us some help. Very kind, yes. So investment tips for newbies. Yeah, yes, yeah, yes. So the, yeah um, there's a lot of stuff out there. Where do you start? Yes, yeah, indeed. I mean, starting on those, on those share trading platforms is a good idea with fairly small amounts of money. Don't put a lot of your savings into a single share or just a few shares um, because, you know, despite what a chat room or someone might say, they, they might not do as well as people expect. Just because a company is a good company and has a good future doesn't mean it's a good share investment yeah. because if the share price is quite high, if everyone else already knows this is a good company, the share price will be high and that means it won't necessarily be a good investment. Mm. So just take care about putting too much money into a few shares. You can, through many of the share trading platforms, go into a managed fund with, that holds a lot of shares. That's a, a lower risk investment. By all means, dabble in the market with small amounts of your savings in individual shares, but don't put a whole lot in one basket, as the old corny saying goes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and look, Jess... Um, uh, not Tess, just a different person, Jess. Yes. Um, she's um, she's perhaps suggested some of the, the golden rules here. So she says, a lot of the financial advice seems to follow the same formula. Start with clearing any consumer debt, build up an emergency fund, pay off your mortgage as fast as you can, invest for your retirement. Um, now, do yeah. you agree? Is that, is that a good general well, formula? Well, yeah, that's what my book says, actually, basically. <laughs> but... <laughs> but I mean, in the very the first two, you can't dispute. Paying off high interest debt, absolutely the number one thing for anyone to do. It's a killer. If you've got credit card debt, you must get rid of that first. Um, and then and then setting up a, an emergency fund and getting insurance and that lined up so you don't get into financial trouble yeah. and the big, the big expense of debt. But then after that, um, you don't necessarily have to buy a home. Yeah. I, th I think Jess mentioned paying down a mortgage, which implies you've got a home. New Zealanders have always felt they have to have a home to get ahead, but you don't. Um, in, in Europe, there are you know more than half the population in some of the European countries like Switzerland and Germany and that do, do not own homes ever. Mm. So as long as you save a big chunk of money and get to retirement with a big savings to cover your accommodation through to when you die, yeah. you don't have to own a home. So if, if people are feeling discouraged about home ownership, there are other ways of doing perfectly well financially. Um, and the, another point about, about what Jess was saying was paying down the mortgage and then investing for retirement. I suggest you do both at do once, yeah, especially in, with Kiwi Saver. Yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Well, look, um, I think risk is something that scares a lot of people, yeah. and we've got a question in from um, Maria Jose. Jose, apologies, Maria, if I've got that wrong. Um, but um, she says, is besides savings and managed funds, are there other ways to increase your investment in a more secure way, so not as risky as shares, for example? What well, could you do? Manage, I mean, you could buy an individual bond, but not many New Zealanders get into that. Then you've got to get into the credit rating of the bond and so on. A bond is basically like a bank term deposit. You put in the money, get interest on it, and then, and then get your money back at the end of the term, although you can sell 
during the term. They're a little bit more complicated than term deposits, but they're similar. Um, but I think, I mean, managed funds are the way to go for most people. You can get into a managed fund at any risk level from cash funds, which are about, about the same risk as bank term deposits, all the way up to shares and even funds that borrow to invest in shares, so they're sort of gearing shares, and that's the very top risk level. Yeah. Um, but they're there all the way through, and they spread your risk for you, and if you go for low fees, it's a bit hard to think of anything that works better, actually, yeah. for many people. Yeah, yeah. and with mm. my regulator hat on, they're well regulated. Yes, um, absolutely. So, so there's, yeah. there are a lot of protections built in, and, and you know you do need to do a little bit of homework still. You need to read the, the product information. Yep. Um, but, yeah, I think they are a really good solution for yeah. many people. And, uh, yeah, and so I think you, you can stick with that, and you, you should be pretty secure. I mean, yes. We don't like to say safe, but... Uh, secure yes. is really yes. a good word. Yeah. Um, so um, Thomas has um, asked, he's a 19-year-old university student expecting mm -hmm. to graduate in 2021. Um, I've managed to save 30000 Wow. wow. Um, well and I'm done, not Thomas. expecting to need any or much of it before I graduate. What do you think would be the best thing to do with it to grow it over the next few years? Yeah, so he's saying the next few years, but who knows for how long. It really mm. depends... Thomas, on when you plan to spend that money, um, if you might, for example, be thinking you'd like to go overseas, although these days that's all a bit, a bit up in the air, but hopefully we're going to get to the point where, yeah. where young people like Thomas can go and have some adventures around the world. Um, if, if you have a clear plan that you really want to have the money available, let's say, to put a down payment on a house, in just a few years, then you want to keep it medium to low risk because you don't want the, f the fund suddenly going down right before you're going to spend the money. On the other hand, if you're a bit flexible about that, if you're planning to say for overseas or a house or something like that, um, and you are a bit flexible about when you do that, you might want to just go for higher risk. And if it goes well, well, that's great. And if it doesn't, you just postpone it all a bit. Mm -hmm. If you've got 30,000, 30, yeah. At 19, he, he's, whatever he does in life, he's going to be fine financially because he's obviously already got, got, got it, it sorted. sorted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think you're young enough to take a bit of risk there. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah. Shona has a term deposit about to mature and mm -hmm. um, notices that her KiwiSaver seems to be earning better rates than what the bank's offering. Yes. Um, so as we're over 65, would it be better to reinvest the money in KiwiSaver than in another term deposit? Yes, and, and in KiwiSaver, if you're going to make more money than a bank term deposit, it's going to be riskier. It, it, it always works like that, that, that if you want higher returns, you're going to be taking more risk. But you can vary the level of risk. You can go into a defensive KiwiSaver fund, the very bottom risk level ones, which are probably slightly riskier than a bank term deposit, but not much... In, and with that, we'll probably, on average, earn you a little bit more of a return. Or you can go a little bit, you know, conservative as the next level up. If you go on to, to um, the sort of website, possibly the FMA website too, there's, there's risk. Um, so I know that sort has got risk profilers where you can key in information, like the KiwiSaver Fund Finder on sorted website tells you you can work out what risk level is suitable for you by answering a few quick questions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, he's one who's um, also a, a bit older. I'm 74. Have 13,000 in a conservative KiwiSaver fund, mm -hmm. and I'd like your suggestions regarding transferring some uh, somewhere else where a I might earn more, and b I can dip into it if necessary. Now, yeah. Um, now the dipping into it, but yeah. um, this person ha doesn't apparently realise that given that that he or she is over. Was she? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, Linda, I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, if, Linda, if you're over, you are over 65, so you can take the money out whenever you want to. It might take a couple of days to get it out, but you just have to ask, and it's basically there to use. Uh, if you want to take a bit more risk, get a little bit of a higher return, just move up one risk level within the KiwiSaver provider you're with, as long as you're happy with that provider. Um, that's a short answer for her. Yeah, yeah. 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 And I guess we, we just need to remind people that 
um, the, the returns on KiwiSaver aren't like a term deposit in the bank, so it's not a guaranteed return. You'll, you'll Good see. point. Yeah. Yes, yes, so. it, it will wobble around. Even in the very lowest risk KiwiSaver funds, it, it'll move around a little bit, yes. That's right, that's yeah. right. Um, Eileen's got an interesting question here. Can you explain the difference between managed funds and PIE funds that you can get through your bank? Sure. Mm. Yeah, Eileen. Um, they're the same thing. Basically. I mean, a managed fund is any fund, KiwiSaver or, uh, or non-KiwiSaver, where you're getting a whole lot of money in from a lot of people and buying a whole lot of investments. And... So they're all called managed funds. Now, PIES stands for Portfolio Investment Entity, and that's a any fund that is a PIE qualifies for tax breaks. Basically, the, the tax breaks are a little bit the tax rates are a little bit lower. Every managed fund I know of in New Zealand is a PIE. I mean, they'd be mad not to be yeah. because they get the and so basically they're the same thing. Right. Yeah. Okay. So if you like working with your bank, you can you could go and get a, a pie fund. That's right. Yeah. Could, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, this one, um, Fiona. So, where to invest six hundred and twenty thousand while I'm looking for a home to buy? This is my mm. hard-earned money from twenty-four years investing in real estate. So, I would like a reasonably safe option. A managed fund's a good option for Fiona at all. I mean, we're talking here. Yeah. So she's. Sounds as though she's planning to reinvest in another house. Um, do you it think? Sounds like it. Sounds yeah. like it, doesn't it? Um, so I would say, Fiona, there are two options. One is bank term deposits. Pathetic interest these days. There's no denying that, but uh, that's the way it is at the moment. Um, and, and keep in mind that inflation is also very low at the moment, and so it's not as bad as it seems. Those, those low term deposit rates. Um, the other option will be to go into a cash fund, which is um, like the lowest level KiwiSaver and non-KiwiSaver funds invest only in cash type products, which are like bank term deposits. If you go onto Smart Investor and look at the um, lowest risk funds on Smart Investor, which are called defensive funds, within that you'll see quite a lot of funds which have got cash in their name. The, Blanky blank cash fund, yeah. and those are the ones you could go into. They'll be, they'll be. The returns will go up and down a little bit, but not a lot. You can have a look at the history of the returns, and they'll tend to be a little bit higher than bank term deposits. It's a little bit riskier, but only really in, in the sense that the interest rates can go down. But I don't. There's no real chance you're going to lose a lot of money in them. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. And and for those who might have just joined, so Smart Investor, you can find that on the Sorted website. So yes. you and I are both involved in the development of we Smart were. Investor. So yes. um, of course we, we think it's a great tool. We and, do. Um, yes. Yeah, a really helpful way to find information about specific funds and yes. all the details about them. Um, and in fact, it might be one way to find an answer to the next question, which is from Pamela. What would be the minimum investment to put into managed funds? Is there, is there a minimum that you know? I don't think there is overall. I mean, it'll be very low. Most of the managed funds, um, KiwiSaver or otherwise, they probably will have a minimum, but to be honest, I don't know what it is. It's probably only about $100. It's, yeah, it's I, th I think they vary a bit. In some of the platforms, you can even get in with smaller yes. amounts because you, you group up with other people. And um, yeah. Actually, it's one of the myths. You, you'll recall that it's in your Hits and Myths guide. So, That's um, right. Because you know, I think people think they have to be rich to invest, don't yep. they? And you really don't. You can, no. you can start with virtually nothing in your KiwiSaver. That's you, right. Yeah. And, and, and if you set up then perhaps an automatic transfer of maybe even just $10 a week or something like that, a lot of the funds will accept very small amounts like that, and that can really make your investment grow incredibly yeah. over the years. Yeah, yes. yeah. yeah. okay. Um, one in here from Aaron. Um, what are your thoughts on a home bias when investing, and what percentage of a portfolio do you recommend? Now, I wonder, what, does he mean here a New Zealand share bias? Is, is that what he thinks? Oh, yeah. or is it so what's it saying? It says, what it? are your thoughts on a home bias when investing and what percentage of portfolio do you recommend? 
Yes, he probably a home bias. Yeah. I thought you were saying home buyer. I was yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, I, I read it at first. I thought, oh, do you mean buying a house? Yes. And what percentage of your portfolio should the house be? But I think I we're think talking his share investing, New aren't we? And, and, and how much to put in New Zealand shares? In New Zealand, versus New Zealand market's overseas. gone gangbusters. So yes. wouldn't yeah. Well, well, the, would you be a fool? Ah, uh, the trouble yeah. is the market. You know, the, the markets that yeah. have done really well are often the ones that have done really badly. In fact, I've got a, a table in my book and I use in my seminars of the best and worst countries investing. Yeah. And over the years, the different the country that was best and the country that was worst, worst markets over the years. And quite often through that table, the one that was best last year goes to worst next year or goes from worst to best. It's a common thing. So whatever market's done really well lately, um, quite often is the one that's been overheated yeah. and does really badly next time. Having said that, New Zealand shares, you, we d benefit from dividend imputation um, for people who don't fully understand that you're basically getting credit for the fact the company's already paid tax and therefore you don't have to pay more tax and that doesn't apply to overseas shares and so that gives you, is one reason to have some New Zealand bias. Um, also just we naturally take more interest in our home market but having said all of that I highly recommend people invest in international funds that in turn invest in shares all over the world. Yeah. Gives you wonderful diversification. It's one of those yeah. cases where you can't just support local, isn't it? No, really? that's right. Yeah. And in fact, I, I don't think it's disloyal at all to invest offshore. If the New Zealand market ever got hit by a terrible earthquake or um, foot and mouth or something like that, the more New Zealanders who've got offshore investments, the better off the country as a whole is because there's some wealth in the country that's, mm. that can be brought back into this country. So I don't think it's disloyal at all. Yeah, and you don't yeah. need to go to an offshore exchange. You can still buy. Absolutely. Yeah, like that's that, a really so good point. Better to get yeah. a New Zealand managed fund yes. that invests offshore for you because they take care of the taxes and, and all the other complicated stuff, the foreign exchange, etc. Yeah. 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 Okay. So if that's all sounding a bit complicated, um, yeah. maybe you need an advisor. John says... Hi, Mary. How do you see a financial advisor fitting into New Zealanders' lives? Yeah, that's a good, good question. Uh, look, I, I think they can be really helpful for some people. I think for a lot of people, you don't need it. You can keep things pretty simple through KiwiSaver, bank term deposits, etc. Um, and reading the guides, the FMA guides, the, the, the information that's out there, a lot of people don't really need an advisor. For those who do need an advisor, I highly recommend they get one where you pay for the advice, either as a percentage of the investment you put in or you pay an hourly rate. I don't recommend investors that will do it for you free because what in fact happens is they're going to getting their money from elsewhere. They're getting their money from the providers that they put your money into and therefore... They deny it, some of them, but the fact is they're going to be more inclined to put your money with a company that gives them a bigger commission. It, it introduces a bias in there that I don't like, mm -hmm. so I highly recommend you go with the ones that charge you money. I think, yeah. yeah. And look, there's some changes coming in the financial advice laws in March next year, which mean that advisors will have to disclose this yep. upfront much more clearly. So I think that's really going to help people. Um, yes. Certainly, you know, some people really do benefit from working with an advisor and getting yes. that that reassurance um, about what to do and, and, you know, if things get a bit tough and investments suddenly go down, having someone you can easily ring or, or, or email and say, is this normal, and be told yep. that it is normal, it can be incredibly beneficial. It, it, absolutely, yeah. yes. There are yeah. some excellent advisors out there that can do that sort of work for you, yes, but pay for it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, Eileen, you're obviously enjoying this. Um, She's aged over 65 and she is due an inheritance. Where do you suggest putting this? So, 65 yeah. and an inheritance. She's got an inheritance. That's a really broad question, Eileen. It depends what you want to do with the money. And if you can't decide, um, park it somewhere in the meantime until you do decide. It, it, once again, it depends on when you're planning to spend it. If you're planning to spend it in the next few years, um, keep it low risk. If you, but if, if you think you might use it for a trip or a new roof on the house or a new car or something in, in 10 years' time, then you can take a bit more risk with it. But um, I do recommend when you get 
sort of good luck money, like an inheritance or um, you win something, uh, to blow a little bit of it on some fun. You go out there and celebrate with it, you know. Yeah. Go and have a neat weekend away or big party yeah. or something like that with some of it. Yeah, but maybe put some of it in, in longer term. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, that sounds sensible. Um, Sarah is saving for her children. She's wanting to save for my two kids' tertiary education. Um, she can afford $1,000 to start with, followed by 200 a month. I've looked into KiwiSaver, but that can't be accessed until retirement or a first home, which doesn't suit me. Can you suggest what else I can consider? Yeah, so she, Sarah wants the money for tertiary education, so when the kids are sort of 17 or so. Um, so really, it comes back to the same old story, how many years before then, if they're, you know, babies, little wee ones, then she might want to put it into a higher risk managed fund, mm -hmm. non Kiwi Saver managed fund that she might she could find on Smart Investor information about that. Look for ones with low fees, I always recommend. <laughs> um, but if the if the children are within ten years or so of spending that money, so that means they're sort of over five or over eight or whatever, more like over eight I suppose, then you want to go into lower risk ones just because you don't want to be taking the money out right after the share market, et cetera, have gone down. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it, it's always it's that same old timing thing that we've said over and over again. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so what are, yes. what are the rules of thumb on the timing? So well, basically, I think if, it's, if you're spending within about three years, yep. make it pretty low risk, um, term deposits, et cetera. If it's three to ten years, and this is just roughly... Yeah. Um, then maybe a balanced fund or middle risk type investment. If it's more than 10 years, that's when you go for the shares or the property or or those sort of investments. And if you're uncomfortable doing those, those higher risk investments, maybe you should stick with middle level, but try and be brave, and especially the women out there. There's a lot of women who are too conservative in their investing, even with their longer term money. And it just does mean that in the long run, they've got less, yeah. and um, that's a real pity, and especially inflation can really eat into the value of long-term savings if you're just being too conservative in bank accounts, et cetera. That's so, right. It's a tip yeah. I give to a lot of women is, you know, um, if you don't have a pay increase, you can still help yourself by just changing into a more risky fund, yes. if, provided you can cope with that because it's going to make you more money in the longer term. Absolutely. So, um, and in fact, yes. the next question... It's exactly my my, um, my bandwagon. Uh, Rebecca says she recently attended a free introduction to investing course pitched at Young Investors and was struck by the fact that she was the only woman out of 40 attendees, which That's is awful. Yes. Um, is this common in investment circles? And if so, what more can be done to tailor these conversations for young women? Now, I've got some opinions on this, but yes. I'd be interested in, in your views, Mary. Is it well, a bit blokey? I mean, you're, you've yes, been in this, this game for years. And I have. Yeah, but the, um, and he Heaps of research shows that um, there are two main differences between the way men and women invest. Women, as I was just saying before, tend to be too low risk. Men, on the other hand, tend to trade too often. Yeah. They, they're they getting into shares, I buy now, they're trying to try and time the markets and work out which individual companies are going to do well and which ones are going to do badly. And that sort of behaviour is definitely not a good idea. It's far better to work out what's a good long-term investment, get in there and stay in there. There is a lot of research that shows people that buy and sell frequently end up with less, a lot less, than people who get in and buy and hold. So women tend to be better at buying and holding. Men tend to be better at taking a bit of risk. Yeah. So you've got some ideas, I think, on how women could get more. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I know, look, there are some um, funds managers who run seminars especially for women investors. Um, and there's some um, uh, social enterprise groups. So, so I've been involved in a couple called Closing the Gap, um, and they run sessions for women. Um, they have female presenters, and, and, and it's really targeted at women, and it's really about breaking down the jargon and breaking down all these um, barriers, I guess, and talking about in, in a lot of detail about things like risk and why don't we invest and why are we scared mm. of it. Um, and, I, you know, you go to those sessions and the women just, uh, they're really bouncing by the end of it because they've suddenly opened up this world that they thought was so complicated and, in fact, 
um, they've been very kind to each other. So, look, I would say if you're a woman keen to get in, in involved in investing, look out for those sorts of things or, or look for a great female blogger. Um, read the Hits and Myths Guide <laughs> or one of Mary's books. Um, you know, just, just find someone who who appeals to you. It is important and it's, it's like when you're getting an advisor, you should find someone that you really get on with because yep. you're going to really need to help get, you know, get some good help from that person. So get someone who's on your wavelength and, yes. and make sure they talk to you in a language you understand and yep. don't be afraid to say, I, I just don't know what you're saying there. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And, so, and uh, yeah. one more just quick thing. Maybe be brave with a fairly small portion of your savings at the beginning. It's a great time. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just yeah. see how that sits with you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so here's um, Deborah, who um, wants to get investing in index funds. So we yes. talked about those before. She is concerned that some of the service providers are unproven. So how can I research them and their reputation and liquidity? Yeah. So reputation as such... Well, the FMA is monitoring managed funds, the New Zealand-based ones, and so you know you can you can trust that they're not going to run away to South America with your money. I, I think, or be pretty certain of that. Um, it sounds as though she's looking at their returns a lot, their past returns, and that's actually not a good basis on which to choose. A managed fund because there's so many times the best. You know, I was saying earlier that the con country that's done really well one year quite often is done really badly the next year, and the same thing happens with Kiwi Saver and non Kiwi Saver funds quite often. Yeah. The, the fund that does really well one year does really badly another year. Intuitively, it, it, sometimes it's because they might be a fund that takes a bit more risk and so they do really well in certain markets and really badly in other markets. It's not, it really isn't a good idea to look at what's done well lately. By all means, c cross off the list the ones that have continued to do really badly over the years. But beyond that, I say go for the ones that charge low fees mm. rather than the ones that have had good performance because yeah. good performance just doesn't necessarily continue at all. Yeah, and look, if you're using regulated products, money's held in custody for you, so yes. it's not like the fund manager has your money. So there is some um, safety there. So um, I, I think, you know, stick to regulated products. Yes, um, Look absolutely. at those things like fees and returns. Um, but, yeah, the, the market has changed significantly. The, the reason the FMA exists was to, to tidy up and, yes. and give a lot more. Um, confidence to investors that the market in New Zealand is safe. So, um, yeah. you know, we we can't ever guarantee that things won't fall over, but it's a lot safer, I guess. A lot. Yeah. And I mean, just one quick quick way to tell is if a, if a company is is offering KiwiSaver products, so go into one of their non KiwiSaver products if you want to have access to the money. Yeah. But they are being regulated and the the Kiwi Saver is being watched particularly closely. Yeah. You're not really going to get a company that offers a Kiwi Saver fund. One of their non-Kiwi Saver funds is not going to be too wobbly. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, you've been talking a lot about fees and low fees. Yes. And and Tiffany has noticed this as well. He says, um, for years I've had a sum of money invested through a broker in a conservative fund. I pay fees on this that appear to be significant that, that appear to significantly reduce the income I get. And th this is the reason why fees are important, because it takes away some of the money you would otherwise get. Yes. He says, well, wouldn't I be better off with the same money in a bank term deposit where I wouldn't pay fees? Um, look, yes, term deposits you don't pay fees, but the returns are awfully low. But it sounds as though he's in a fund with the broker, it sounds as though the fees might be pretty darn high. Yeah. And I would suggest that he can do perfectly well getting into his own managed fund from Smart Investor, say, where the fees will almost certainly be lower. And on Smart Investor, you can rank the fees, the funds, according to their fees, yeah. lowest fees first. And I always say, rank them that way. When you go into the website, you can choose how to rank them. And I would say go with lowest fees first and then choose from among the low fee funds. Yeah. Yeah. And look, I, I know the last time I looked at Smart Investor, conservative funds were averaging on a five-year basis about 3 or 4%. So, yes. And some of them had fees nearly 1%. So that's... That's rather high. You know, yes. so that's taking a lot off your 3 or 4% it, it, return, isn't it? It absolutely is. Yeah. And on Smart Investor, they tell you what the average fee is for funds of that type. Yeah. So you can sort of compare what you're looking at with the average and 
keep an eye on those fees. They yeah. do matter. Yeah, so, yeah, so good on you, Tiffany, for actually keeping an eye on it and yeah. understanding what the impact is. Because I think a lot of people just think, oh, it's 1%. That doesn't sound very much. No, that, yeah. But when your returns are really low, that's a lot, isn't and, it? And yeah. look, it can mean $100,000, $200,000 difference in retirement. A low fee fund versus a high fee fund is... It's, yeah. tr it's horrific. Yeah. 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 Um, now, Yang, we've probably answered your question for you here because we keep mentioning it, but I want to invest in a managed fund or funds, but not KiwiSaver. I've spent hours online trying to find a simple comparison of the annual performance of such funds, but I am at absolute loss. I found some good sites for KiwiSaver at Sorted, but that's it. Is there such a website for non KiwiSaver funds? Yeah, well, so we've, we've actually already answered it. Smart Investor is. Yeah is the way to go. Yeah. But as soon as you get on there, you click on compare, and then it gives you the option of KiwiSaver or non-KiwiSaver funds, and and then away you go. I think we call them managed funds on that website. We do, yeah. Yeah, yes. yeah. so it is it's available through the Sorted website, so you can um, go to Sorted and uh, Smart Investor will appear on the list of tools, um, or you can just Google Smart Investor. It has got a bit of a complicated URL. I think it's something like smartinvestor.sorted.org.nz, which is a bit of a mouthful, but just but remember Smart Investor, yeah. and, and, and you'll find it there. And we've got loads of links to it from the FMA uh, website, so we, we link to all the really useful tools on Sorted from yes. the FMA website. So, uh, yeah, you, you'll find it if you uh, come to us as well. Um, Simran has been a very good girl and has set a goal to pay back her student loan that her parents kindly paid off for her and plans to do so within 10 years. I'm currently making monthly contributions to four different managed funds. Three of them are higher risk and one is moderate. Is this the best way to go about achieving my goal? Yes. Now, now good on her for a starter planning to pay back a parent. So her parents paid off the student loan for her, mm. but she's saying, you know, I'd like to pay that back. Um, so, well done. Um, and she is trying to set aside some money in several different funds to grow enough to pay the parents back. I would say she's in a classic situation where she can take higher risk because if the markets did plunge, and therefore it took her longer to pay back the parents than she planned, that probably wouldn't matter that much, I'm, I'm guessing. Yeah. And so it's not like she was, you know, hell-bent on buying a house in four years or something, in which case that's the goal and she really wants the money by then. In her case, it's just, I'm guessing... The sooner I get the money, the better. Yeah. But so she might try a higher risk fund and just roll with it, you know, when it go and it will go down. It's not if, it's when. It will go down, and sometimes it will go down a lot, and it might take quite a long time to recover, but she could just roll with that and pay her parents back when she can, and yeah. good on her. So yeah. this is a case um, where you really think about what, what is your goal here, and... Yes. And, but what are your personal circumstances as yes. well? So it's not like it's a hard and fast. She's, she wants to pay it back within 10 years, which is great. Yes. But as you say, if her parents have paid it back already, they're probably not sitting there, you know, drumming Starving. their fingers, yeah. are they? Yeah. And, um, so yeah. if she can do it a slightly different way, um, yes. and that, that works. So yeah. yeah, just really think about, you know, how, how your circumstances would vary those general rules. Absolutely, yeah. yes. Yeah. 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 So um, David is... Uh, well, he says, um, we are in our 40s with three children under 12 and we live in our freehold property. We have 200000 saved in a term deposit and we're thinking about buying another property, but we're wary of current prices. Any advice for the best use of our savings? Yeah, so another property could be a holiday home, but I'm guessing they're thinking about a rental property. Do you think that sort of sounds more like that? I think I it think. sounds like a rental, yeah, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, and rentals, as everybody knows, can be brilliant investments. Um, so many New Zealanders have done really well with rental properties. Um, they are, though, riskier than people realise in, in that you're typically borrowing quite a lot of money to make the investment. And then, if, so if the property value grows, you get the growth on your money and the bank's money. And that's why they end up being such a brilliant investment for most people. But things can go wrong when, when people. Um, quite often your, the rent isn't covering all the expenses of the property 
especially if you're paying a lot of interest as well as all the other the rent and the rates and the insurance etc cetera, etc cetera. so things can go wrong and if you end up being forced to sell a house you never want to get in a position of being forced to sell anything mm. shares property whatever the investment is you always want to be thinking now what would happen if I lost my job or something else bad happened um, when people sometimes end up being forced to sell rental properties it can happen when property prices have gone down, they do go down. People forget that, but they do. Um, if you just look back on the graphs, and I, I've known people who have been forced to sell a rental property when the markets were down, mm. and they therefore lost their job, and the prop house prices are down, and you can end up selling the house for less than the mortgage. And that means you end up with no house and a debt to the bank, which is a horrible thing to happen. That's the the risky part of rental property. So just be aware of that. Make sure you're in a position where you're not going to be forced to sell and be prepared to hold on to it for quite a few years because who knows what's going to happen to the property markets. The economists were predicting they were going to go down. They haven't so far, but we it's very hard to tell in the current it's environment. Yeah. yeah. So the other yeah. option would be your managed fund paper. Yeah, the yeah. good old yeah, managed yeah. funds. Yeah. It's a lower risk option, yes. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Now, um, I've managed to confuse Lisa um, by um, talking about regulated products all the time. Oh, and how yes. do you know if it's a regulated product? And yes. Yeah. yeah. That you're probably more <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> answer than to be working for the regulator, Gillian. Yeah. yeah. Do you yeah. want to have a So, um, regulated products are, are um, licensed and monitored by the FMA. So, when you look at the product material, it should say something like, oh, we're licensed by the FMA. Um, but of course you want to check that out yourself. So we have lists on our website um, of all the licensed providers. But generally speaking, in New Zealand, managed funds, ETFs, KiwiSaver, they're all regulated products. Um, and then uh, shares have certain rules that they have yeah. to, 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 to abide by. They, they are sold through regulated exchanges. Um, so most of the financial um, investments that, that are in New Zealand are, are regulated. But just just check. Sometimes people will say, and we see this a lot in the scam space, they might say, oh, we're registered in New Zealand. And that's mm. a bit different from regulation. So it, it can be a bit tricky. If you're even not sure, just um, drop us an email at questions at fma.gov.nz or give us a ring. Um, I can't remember our phone number off the top of my head, <laughs> but it's on the front page of our website. We, we would really rather you called and checked than, than entered something that wasn't regulated because it does give you protections and that's really important. Yeah. Um, and it's a really important role that we play. Um, really important. I'm just working f through a letter at the moment from a, a reader of my Herald column who's been a scam victim, you know, mm. and and it happens just too much. Go with the mainstream products. Um, yeah. the, the others are just, it's, it's very sad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, um, Sue, so, oh, there's lots of numbers in this one. Okay, is it better to have a 200k property and 100k in savings or 300k to invest? I'm 64, so should I add to KiwiSaver now? Is it better to have a 200k property and 100k in savings or just make it 300k and invest the lot? So, uh, I wonder if, when she's saying 200k and property, is she talking about paying down in mortgage? Do you I'm think not I'm, too sure. No, I'm not too sure what mm, she so means about that one either, really. So, so if she's 60, let's, add, let's look at the, the easier bit. I'm 64, should I add to KiwiSaver now? No reason not to. It, it, in fact, at 64, you know, you, you can start taking it out whenever you want to at 65. And so you don't need to think of it any longer as a tied up product. It's, it's like a bank product in a way that you can put your money in and take it out whenever you want to. So that's, yeah. Uh, the other bit's a bit, yeah, we don't, to be honest, really so know. It's a bit hard, hard to know, isn't it? But yeah. I guess, um, yeah, I mean, if you had 300k to invest, you would probably put it in a mix of assets when you yes. diversify and. and uh, she's perhaps suggesting she, she was going to diversify the other way with some property and some savings. So yes. perhaps there's uh, not, not too much wrong with either strategy. No, yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed. Yeah, yes. depending on what she does with it. Yeah. Um, Karen has, um, she's been putting 8% of her salary into KiwiSaver. 
but she's wondering if it's more sensible to just put 3% in and put the additional 5% into a fund I can access before I'm 65, um, or whether it's unwise to split the money if the accumulative value would be lower. You know, to that second part, because I read that question earlier, um, she's thinking that if she puts, let's say, 50000 in one investment and 50000 in another investment, it won't grow as much as 100000 in a single investment. Right. And that's a confusion people often have. They think the compounding won't be as good, but it will be as good. It will be as good. You'll get 50000 growing that much, and the 50,000 growing that much, and that'll equal exactly the same as the 100,000 growing that much. If you see what I mean, it's mm. not, that's a fallacy that's quite common. There's nothing wrong with splitting your money. You can still get the same percentage growth in each lot, yeah. and that's just as good. So then you get to the point of access, and access is an interesting one because for most people, being out of KiwiSaver is good because they've got access to the money, and I always say to people, look, you never know, it's not just that bad things might happen, although there are examples like um, one of the family members gets an illness and there's a drug they need that Pharmac doesn't fund. You mm -hmm. know, you there's all sorts of things that happen to people that they would never foresee, or the roof suddenly starts leaking or you discover you've got a leaky home. There's, there's all kinds of examples of unforeseen bad stuff that happens where you need money. But there's also um, good things that happen. Um, like um, Gareth Morgan made a lot of money because his son Sam said, Dad, do you want to invest and trade me with me when, when Sam was starting trading me? And, and they both made a huge amount of money out of that. I mean, the point is you never know when a younger member of the family or you yourself or your partner has got this brilliant idea yeah. that you want investment money for. So access generally is good. The only exception is some people find that if they've got access to money, they uh, spend it. And so quite a few people have said to me, well, actually, I'm putting my money in KiwiSaver, so it's so not going to get my fingers on it and blow it on travel or clothes or yeah. something like so that. So it's a little bit about knowing yourself, isn't it? It is. Yeah, I yes. think I probably favour the putting it into KiwiSaver and keeping it away from myself. Not, yeah. that, I, yes. not that I'm extravagant, but I also sometimes people say to me, I then I'd need to make another decision. Um, and, and some people find it really hard, although I think you've got quite a good tip there in terms of, you know, go, go and have a look on... On, on smart uh, smart investor or, or another thing, or your KiwiSaver provider, and see if they've got a similar non KiwiSaver fund. So yes. it's not a hard decision to make. That's right. Yeah. Yes, yes. Very often, if you're happy with your KiwiSaver provider, they'll have a non KiwiSaver similar fund. Yeah. Go with that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, look, um, we, we're just about um, at the end of the time, so we'll just do one final um, question from uh, Anonymous. Oh, yes. <laughs> what should I do if I can't afford a financial advisor? Yeah, and uh, um, don't go to one that's free, <laughs> as I said before. I really don't recommend that. I just don't think that works well. Look, the FMA website, I think it's... I'm not just saying this because this is an F FMA webinar. There's all sorts of resources on there for investors that I think a lot of people probably don't realise are there. If you just click on investors and follow on through, and it's not written in a technical manner. It's written in a way that ordinary people can understand um, from the, this little guide I've written, but a whole lot of others too that are very accessible to people and the sorted website um, and, look, books. Um, <laughs> I have to say that. Um, th there are lots of ways out there that you can you can learn and, and then keep your investing fairly simple and you can do really well. Yeah. Yeah. OK, well, look... Thanks, Mary, um, and I, I hope that's that's helpful as a starting point for for anonymous. Yes. Um, yeah. Look, we, we are at the end of um, in, uh, end of the, the hour, so sadly that is all the time that we have um, for questions today. I'm really sorry if we haven't been able to answer your question. We'll endeavour to answer all the questions and post them on our website in the next week. Um, if you didn't catch the whole hour, it'll still be available via our Facebook page and the FMA website too. So that's fma.govt.nz. Um, we encourage you to check out the FMA website, which, um, as Mary has so kindly said, has lots of investor resources about a wide range of investments. So thanks again for being here, Mary. Um, thank you to Conference for helping us put this together. And thank you to all of you at home for watching today. Ka kite anō. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Yes, thanks very much everyone.